Hello, Nevada County. This is David Clark Carroll with the Nevada County Tech Connection. Uh, we're an initiative of the Economic Resource Council, really tasked with looking at the intersection of technology, business, education, uh, workforce training, and since tech's in everything, uh, pretty much everything. So I'm joined today by Monique Priestley. She is the founder and executive director at the Space on Main in Bradford, Vermont. Uh, the Space on Main is a co-working space that is really uh, filling the gaps that Nevada County is very familiar with. You know, where do you go when you need to do video conferencing with a unstable home connection? Where do you go to meet other people working remotely so you don't feel crazy isolated, you know? Uh, so first off, thanks for joining me, Monique. Really great to have you on. Yeah, thanks so much, David. So tonight's tonight's episode is looking at a phenomenal program called Girls Who Code. Girls Who Code is all over the planet. Um, this is one of these I uh, organizations I, I knew about, but didn't know a whole lot of details about until it's like, oh, this could be a fun topic to talk about. And looking at and realizing that Nevada County's chapter is working on getting back up and running. We used to have a more active chapter um, run by uh, Remington Maxwell. And like so many things during COVID, slowly kind of shut down. Uh, so excited to try and get that back up and going. And I wanted to talk to Monique because she has successfully launched a chapter. And I was very excited to see on Facebook the other day, uh, you've actually got, you're, you're up and going. You've had a couple of meetings now. So we'll get into a whole lot more on all that, but just wanted to ask kind of as a starting point, how'd you get to this point in your career where you're the founder, executive director of a co-working space, you're, you know, helping make this Girls Who Code local chapter happen. Uh, what was your career path? Yeah, thanks, David. Um, so first, I would say, actually, it was fun um, to share uh, with the, the girls in the group um, last weekend. I, I tried to give a little bit of background. And my first, uh, my uncle, probably when I was like eight, um, had me dissect a computer with him and like showed me all the, the working parts and stuff. Um, so that was like a foundational <laughs> moment um, for my life. Um, and then also um, showed me how to like write a, write a super basic um, website using HTML, um, you know, and then from there, I went to like space camp, <laughs> which was like the um, a local <laughs> university had different tracks. So you could go into like um, math or government or anything, but I went into the, um, the astronomy section um and we had all of our our classes during the week um in the planetarium and so one thing that they had us do is to work on like research projects you know we're like fourth grade so <laughs> research but um and uh then they had us um put together websites that we could um share our stuff on um and so that was the first time that i was like making um uh, you know, I threw up like alien gifts on there, the Mission Impossible <laughs> soundtrack, um, a star twinkly backgrounds, um, the uh, text, the marquee text that turns the scrolls across and turns a rainbow. <laughs> and stuff like that. So um, that was the, I actually think I have that on a floppy disk somewhere, um, a backup of it. But that would, between those two experiences, that was like, I can, I have the power to like do these things. Um, and I just need to like learn more about them. So uh, I had kind of been dabbling with websites ever since here and there, um, making my own like portfolios and stuff like that. Um, and uh, in high school, um, I was hanging out a lot in the computer lab and the um, network administrator asked me um, if I wanted to have a job um, for kind of like after school and on the weekends and in the summers. Um, and what I realized was he wanted me to like do all the stuff uh, that he didn't want to do, <laughs> which was um, climbing on a ladder. Um, I actually wired like the whole high school um, for to get ready for fiber. So we had wow. before we had like computers, yeah, computers in like the computer lab. Um, but then after I wired, we had them in the library and in every classroom. Um, and so then I also learned how to like um, image the computers to, you know, make copies of them so that I could wheel them upstairs <laughs> and have the same uh, programs on there. And so 
between kind of the web design, which is something I, I took clients like right in my senior year of high school, um, and then also having that network admin background. Um, then I started in Russian and computer science for um, undergrad at, at University of Vermont. Um, quickly went through all of the web kind of related courses and found that that was really where my, my passion was. So I transferred um, to Northern Vermont University Linden um, and continued for um, degrees in graphic design and digital media. Um, and while I was kind of doing that, um, supporting myself with uh, the student like work programs, um, being like tech support in the computer labs late at night and fixing printers <laughs> and stuff like that um, and continuing to do websites. Um, and so, yeah, from there, um, because I had already done so much on my own when I was at Linden, I spent most of the time actually helping other students um, because most I was coming at it from like writing code from scratch, whereas the programs were really teaching students how to use like Dreamweaver and um, WYSIWYG kind of editors. Um, and so that let me kind of be like more of an, an aid um, and kind of explore the things that I found the most interesting. Um, and then following that, kept doing web design on my own um, outside of school and then um, went to Seattle. Um, well, in the background of all of that, I like took jobs for things like um, for a printing press. I um, was the I think it was just like an intern um, to start and they wanted me to like work on data entry for in their FileMaker program. Um, and there's just like thousands of records. And I realized very quickly that with the like minimal kind of like coding skills that I had that I could automate all of that so that instead of spending a week trying to data entry thousands of spreadsheet entries, I could de develop a little FileMaker scripts to just do it in like 30 seconds. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that trend, like that is like a trend that continued um, at different jobs. And then when I moved to Seattle to do a, a um, master's of communication and digital media um, program at University of Washington, um, whereas all of my undergrad stuff had been really on like production of like videos and animations and websites and page layouts and things like that. The masters was more in like the psychology of like why people use different platforms and when and how human networks and how networks in general work and how to like leverage those and um, how they use emerging technology in third world countries versus the United States um, and like all kinds of stuff. Um, and I took a job at a campus CE corporation, which is like educational technology company. Um, and I was like the third fourth employee, fifth employee, um, and the third that's still there <laughs> um, and was working full time for them. And it's similarly to the like the printing um, printing press uh, is that they wanted me to do these tasks that I quickly was like this could be done more efficiently. Um, so just kind of dove in with my coding skills to, um, I was kind of in charge of like branding um, our software websites for universities to try to get it to match their branding. And at the time it was really kind of a like, put a logo here and change like a color here. Um, but I developed like a, instead of taking like 16 hours to do a site, um, worked on doing a template that I could change the style sheet for. Um, and that turned into like an hour at a time um, of work. Um, so really trying to yeah leverage that stuff. Um, and then I came back um, and I was came back with a remote job. So I came back to Vermont um, and was working remotely, but really flying back and forth between the two coasts, trying to figure out where to be um, since I knew I could work anywhere. Uh, and it was really the like sense of community that like kept me here. Um, but in order to stay here, I had to figure out something to like make it work. <laughs> um, so that's <laughs> kind of what evolved into the co-working space. But with that, bringing in a background in design and communication technology, um, and and then also at that point had been on a lot of different like local boards and nonprofits and things like that and commissions. Um, so had kind of this in my brain <laughs> tying all of those pieces together that's kind of what the space on main turned into um and at this point we're four years in um we're actually we have me full time um sorry and 
and really trying to like start programming that actually and investing in the tech programming to get people excited um at a super young age realizing that they can really do they can work <laughs> like as early as they want to they can create things uh, that they're passionate about and that they can do it from wherever they are um including staying here <laughs> and and that's just such a such a crucial element and part of why i want to talk about this program it's for rural counties and towns to keep people there there needs to be some way for them to contribute to the economy and sure. job jobs like this where you said you could be on either coast you could be anywhere stuff like that is going to be the way forward you know um now you also mentioned you got involved with various commissions and so forth and i realized i forgot to mention when i introduced you you're even a political candidate you're running for uh vermont house which is uh so awesome so yeah hopefully you win and i get to say i knew her i knew her back when uh, yeah thanks <laughs> um, and i think so much of what you just mentioned is is i think so in line with what we'd like to see happen in Nevada County too, where it's, you know, you were able to come back. You are able to find a place for yourself in a community that's not the big city, that's not, you know, uh, surrounded by a million other tech workers. Um, and yeah, awesome. <laughs> so let's cycle it back to Girls Who Code, which, you know, is aimed at giving the next generation skills to do what you what you've done with with your life um and when i was looking at the website and really just kind of familiarizing myself a little bit more with, with the bigger background of girls who code uh you know the website notes that we know that the biggest drop off of girls in computer science is between the ages of 13 and 17 and you mentioned that you're you know your senior year of high school you're you're already taking on freelance clients so did you find that there was a kind of struggle to keep involved through through that age for you or, or were you able to to keep the fire going um because uh yeah i would say because of that um uh computer lab network administrator at our high school uh i had somebody who was like fostering that tech uh that tech interest um anything you know anything that i was like kind of finding online that i wanted to explore he was very supportive of um and then having a job that was paying me to like continue the interest uh, was also a good in investment in um those skills developing in me um but i think i think even on like uh from that like first time that I got the introduction to the inner workings of the computer and like learning code at that young of an age, um, that was really powerful. And then also like grew up in um, a society um, where, you know, we started having video games. Um, one of my uncles actually, another one of my uncles was working for a company uh, that created TurboGrafx-16. So he brought a TurboGrafx-16. <laughs> um, and that's actually, I don't know anybody else ever who's had one that I've been friends with. Um, but that, and then, you know, just kind of being, I guess, encouraged both by my parents, but also like teachers to explore. Um, if I had not had such support um, from other adults um, in being able to explore technology. I don't think that I would have necessarily. So when when did you first become aware of Girls Who Code and what, you know, how, how did you wind up la launching your own chapter? Yeah, um, so I would, I actually don't know how far back. I, I definitely remember hearing about it like years ago, just at different like conferences and things like that. Um, but it wasn't until probably the last year I've really been trying to work on um, making sure that we're not just like focused on what we can offer here, but how we can leverage partners, both like statewide um, or nationally or internationally. Um, so things like partnerships with, um, we have a partnership with uh, Grow with Google um, and uh, Startup Champions Network and a bunch of different like networks that can provide and co-starters um and so girls who code was like another one of like how can we not recreate the wheel leverage stuff that people have already produced especially when it comes to curriculum um that is kind of like packaged and um we can leverage a name that already has like brand association and things with it um but also just like 
be able to manage as sometimes a single person like team um just a plug and play like let's just try it out um and girls who code is that it was like super easy they you know you sign up on their website um but then they give you the curriculum they give you tutorials of how to like run a class they give you how much time you should spend on each thing they give you they're very flexible in a way that you can um choose kind of what to, which technologies to work on as long as you're kind of like tying it back to you reminding like working on empowerment and um letting kids have um agency and like how the classes are kind of flowing um while also like letting them just experiment with different technology so um it was like a perfect fit um for me who i like to have a little bit of adaptability um and be able to adapt to say for like any group of kids is going to be super unique from each other so i want to make sure that it's flexible enough that like if they don't if they don't really like a piece of the say that they're not actually into web design but they're into robotics like it's flexible enough that i can like focus as long as we're keeping kind of the the core of like supporting um girls and gender expansive youth um to explore that it's pretty awesome that the curriculum is that flexible because you know it as I said at the introduction, tech's under underneath everything these days, but that means code is underpinning almost everything. So like you said, you you can do robotics or you can do websites. And those are about as, you know, real world, physical, temporary, visual, you know. Uh, so th that's a cool range to be able to draw on. Um, and looking at, you know, it's it's this is pretty much a entirety of education uh program you know the website even site worked with legislators to close the gender gap in tech and k through 12 classrooms so how, how early how young are some of the you know students that that you've had at your uh your your first couple of sessions now yeah and they kind of break things nicely into different like curriculum focuses for um third through yeah three gr grades three through five and then grades six through twelve um and so I'm kind of like bordering I actually reached out to them and I was like I kind of want to do something that, <laughs> that rides that gap is that okay and they were like yeah that's fine <laughs> um so we're doing um grades five through eight for this one um and I definitely have done stuff like we actually will do um, more of the you can do this kind of in a format where it's like after school we're doing on the weekends um, or something that's like a week long you sit down and you just like um, do an immersive thing for a week um, so we will end up playing with all ages because um, for a lot of our we have like a we call it the space camp <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, it's a week-long camp and the, in that we start we've we started as young as eight um, so definitely want to be able to do that for right now with this, I really wanted to kind of focus on a slightly older um, because I, some of the, I think focus, um, <laughs> focus and kind of um, exploring in a way where I wanted some more feedback um, from the students. I felt like I could get that a little bit um, trying to grow this. I felt like I could get that a little bit more with older kids. Um, who are more a little more confident in saying like yeah this really doesn't work for me <laughs> um you know that kind I, of thing I mean it's it, that's the classic middle school age you know where yeah, it's yeah. you know you're you, you know what you don't like you don't necessarily know what you like yet but you're not shy about saying this is terrible I'm done so I, totally. I, I definitely get, <laughs> get your logic in that of okay who, who's going to be honest with me and and, yeah, and yeah. tell me is my program working so and that, also still cool. be open and excited <laughs> so like, yeah, and, yeah. And at the same time like I, I still have fond memories of like middle school science because that's that's the age when you you start you start to get trusted to do stuff right so I uh, yeah awesome awesome thinking as far as that being being your your first cohort um now this this space space camp uh that you'll be doing is that going to be a summer activity, a vacation activity? How are you kind of scheduling that to get the most engagement? Yeah, so, and then that's definitely, as we start this programming, that is the biggest question is, um, and even when I do adult programming, honestly, we do uh, entrepreneurship programming, um, trying to experiment with different days and times and schedules. So we started out with 
um, a like February vacation um, for a week. Um, at one point we had like six kids um, and that was like, oh, I need more kids. Um, but they all got excited and then they told their friends and then we've been like waitlisted every single time since. So <laughs> then we did it again in April and then we did it again in the summer. Um, and I have kids who are like, you know, they do the week and they're like, all right, we're coming back next week. Like, no, you're coming back in maybe like six months. <laughs> um, so I need to like do um, my plan for this summer is to try to do at least um at least five weeks of like camp um, and then do a few after school programs, always playing with that, the dates and times and things um, and then mix up the age ranges. Um, so there's definitely, I feel like the investment in the like eight, nine year olds that they will, if they're like excited and if I can capture their kind of like energy and imaginations then then they're like invested to keep going as they grow older um i'm already like seeing that in just a year of, of playing around with it um so yeah very very cool um i mean it, it, it's so challenging trying to hit, hit that sweet spot of scheduling and to hear that you're you know right off the bat running into waitlisting that, that, that really speaks to how much demand there is for this type of programming. Um, you know, like we, we did a Python, you know, not super extensive, like six meeting Python class. First, first day, it's like we had to bring in chairs from the other offices. Uh, there's just so much hunger for this, this type of education. Um, so I, I want to add, David, if it's okay. Yeah. So we did try to experiment with after school and that actually didn't like I had like one sign no. up for two okay. programs. So what I did was, again, the flexibility just like moved it to Sundays, doubled up the like time. Um, but yeah, it's, that is going to require um, more conscious relationships with the schools and timing like six months earlier than I have been. Um, but, but I'm positive because it has been working on a Sunday, I'm positive it can work. It's just a matter of like those relationships and making sure that I'm like getting out information to people early. The one thing that, that hits my mind when you say you have a hard time with the after school, do you feel that potentially the curriculum is too similar or, or not similar but to that it may take too many similar brain patterns as the daily school and that there's not the oh yes let's have more of that thing or I actually or don't know I think it was really just competition with sports yeah. um and clubs and things and then also um rural uh transportation um so we have a bus stop that um, actually stops like almost right in front of our building. I didn't know that it existed and no one else that I had talked to knew that it existed <laughs> and I actually wrote to the school and I'm like, can you get a bus stop? And they're like, yeah, that that, that is a thing already. Um, but <laughs> parents, like that was one of the mean feedback is like, I can't transport my kids. So also just making sure that I am communicating about the resources like transportation that'll bring them right to the door at the time they need to be here and timing around that. I mean, that's, that's one of those... It, it's such a simple side of, of, of the equation, right? It's like, how how are my people actually going to get here? But so many times it's like, I don't know why people aren't signing up for this shift and it's because they can't get there. So that's that's really insightful. Um, hopefully you can get, get them on that bus more. Um, what, what sort of things have like the typical session like that you posted a couple of pictures of the other day, what, what's kind of that introductory like you're let's say you know a sixth year old your your parents showed you this hey signed you up for girls who code and you're like what's that and they're like oh you can learn how to code with other girls okay and then you show up what's what's kind of that first that first session that first meeting like yeah, and so I'm probably doing it a little bit differently than other chapters are because I kind of already <laughs> anticipated that uh, from other programs in the past. Um, so I'm trying, one, we spent some time just like settling in. I gave them some background on me, trying to give them some like start off every session with like practically, here's an example of like real world, what we're talking about. Um, and then I'm I'm mixing in a mix of Girls Who Code curriculum with um, kind of like supplemental stuff, like, and 
keeping it broad so that we're constantly experimenting and introducing them to new things. So for instance, like Girls Who Code focuses um, somewhat on like Swift um, in part of like there's a couple tracks you can take. Um, so we did Swift for one session um, and then, but we also mixed in um, Spiro Robot. Sorry, danger of a co-working space interview. <laughs> <The> doors opening. <laughs> um, uh, we mixed in. Um, I bought curriculum for Sphero robots, so they're little balls that can like roll around and they can control them. And it's the exact. The nice thing is like, um, girls who could also do scratch, and so with the block editing. So while we're not necessarily doing scratch, we're doing the exact same type of thing that would easily translate from Sphero to like using Scratch um, if they wanted to do that. Um, so really trying to like make sure we're introducing them to things that are transferable to different like languages or programs. Um, yeah, uh, but that's... let's see. Yeah, <laughs> well, and also like uh, it is very much was trying to explore with them like why are you here <laughs> and then sometimes it's the parents or yeah, the parents think it's a good idea for me to be here um so in those cases um introducing them to different things but also like gauging well if we're going to be together for like 20 hours and we're going to do something tech related like what do you what do you want to do and the group overwhelmingly in the last session said um which i was not expecting which i should have expected was uh creative like they want to do um they want to, they all want to use Procreate. So I need some iPads, <laughs> um, but they really want to do like digital art. They want to do animation and they want to do video games. So then um, I purchased the um, Bloxels um, software. And so that gives them the ability to one, just play some video games so they can like see what other people do and start kind of absorbing without really realizing it, like logic based things, or like, if I touch this thing, it's going to hurt me, you know? So how do I build that into a game? Um, and also just different design elements. Um, and so that has been fun. And from here, we're kind of like everything moving forward is going to be like, here's an introduction to a thing. If you get bored with it, go back to something we already worked on. Like at this point, some are like, I want to go back to Spiros or I want to go back to this other thing. And that's fine. So also just like being flexible as we go um, for everybody's individual interests. Well, and that's, it's just awesome because, it, you know, if the, there's so many different directions to go that, that if you're giving them all these different avenues, it's like, you're going to find something you like. If you, if you haven't found something you like, just look a little harder. It's, it's there. Uh, I particularly like the, you know, it, the video game, video game angle because it, it's so when I grew up playing video games it wasn't as social a thing as I think it is now where it's like the uh multiplayer where you've got your friends in your earpiece is so pr present now um but it's also there's a have you run into global game jam has this no I'm gonna write there? that down <laughs> so though we did this like I don't want to say how long ago because it's going to sound like a long time ago, but maybe four or five years back, I'd said it anyway, uh, did a global game jam. And it's basically all around the world. Uh, groups have like 24, 48 hours to design a game. So you get everyone, you know, let's say you cram all the girls in the makerspace for the weekend. You know, you, you have a steady supply of pizzas coming. And by the end of it, they have a game. So <laughs> uh that's awesome in our case we'd have to do nutella and pretzels um because that is a snack <laughs> of choice <laughs> hey, that's that's even better and it's uh it, it doesn't go bad when uh it sits out for like you know 40 of those 48 hours so like totally. like you're thinking there um so okay so, so you've got a whole bunch of girls excited about learning how to make video games what what sort of uh what drove them in that direction? What was it that they had favorite games that they played that they saw that as, you know, um, a fun field to get into? What, what do you think was kind of driving that, that direction? Yeah. Uh, Minecraft <laughs> and Roblox. Um, yeah. so I think, and also them already knowing that I'm, uh, an adult is cool with video games. <laughs> um, because, uh, I, I really think that's a big piece of it. Um, 
so we have a Minecraft club as well that we do every last Sunday of the month. Um, and so we have 16 um, kids on um, that's grades three through five. Um, and then they're just playing Minecraft on an educational server. Um, and so in that we've incorporated a little bit of like using code builder and sometimes they'll be like, here's a challenge to do this thing. But for the most part, we're just letting them do whatever. And we do a, a part where they set group rules and kind of expectations with each other. Um, and yeah, so that, so I've already seen the power of like new friendships and bonding and just like um, supporting this crazy stuff they want to try <laughs> um, through that. Um, and we did a number of, uh, we did some Minecraft at the youth camps as well. Um, so I would say I was also already in a mindset of um, trying to like bring in an educational aspect of video games. Um, and actually a lot of my masters, I thought I focused on um, board game, video game design and, and gamification in marketing and things like that. Um, but yeah, they, they're all Minecraft all the time um, in school and everything. Uh, so they had the safe space that they could be like, oh, I love Minecraft and I want to do it. Um, and so we'll definitely mix in some of the code builder um, but I don't think that, I don't know how many of them actually believed that they'd be able to work on video games and develop the video games during, um, the girls who code. So finding block souls, um, and being like, uh, it was interesting. We worked through, they have like a workbook. So they, they really didn't, they wanted to start on the computer, but I was really pushing like most technology and most design starts at like a paper brainstorming level where you're doing wireframes and then you like do all the sketches and then you move on to investing the time in like doing a digital wireframe and then you spend the time like actually coding it and then you color it and that kind of stuff um so trying to like do that process so the workbook was really good at like who is your main character why do we care about them uh what do they look like um what kind of enemies are they going to run into in this video game world um what is is there like some kind of overarching story like in mario where they're trying to save the princess um type thing that's going on and then uh what does that actually look like what are power-ups um what are examples of power-ups and how they interact with your char your main character um so it's a really cool like development mindset to get them into and then and they actually they all pushed back on that <laughs> hardcore, but actually after they started doing it um, and they started pairing up with each other, I really tried to like uh, encourage, you don't have to like work silently by yourself, like go talk to other people and share each other's ideas across different teams. Um, and so that has been, they got into it. They got really into it. Um, and then after like an hour or so, they're like, all right, it's computer time. We've, we've done enough of this paper stuff, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is fun. And that also gave the ability for me to like we talked through the translation of like bits like the um individual pixels of what the, so they had a 13 13 by 13 grid which translated to one big block on the video game and so basically talking through just like the pixels to the like block elements uh translation of size which was fun i think that it's such a cool approach to get them I feel like when when we're on the computer in the digital world, it's just so immersive to force them out of that and be like, okay, what are the thought processes behind all of this? It was is just so cool, but it sounds like they're really engaged, which is so just the the, the key element of what girls could really should be doing. It's it's making them excited about it and preventing that drop off between ages of thirteen and seventeen. Um, I mean, there the Girls Who Code website is both inspiring and, and horrific when I look at some of the stats. Uh, like saying 1995, 37% of computer scientists were women. Today, it's only 24. So that's like, I've got to be one of the few fields that since then has undiversified as far as gender. Um, and I think a key part of that is that there needs to be that, that career modeling where, where someone like you is in the room showing, hey, you can do this. It can be fun. It does not have to be a, a cold, hard slodge between a bunch of bros who've been coding for 48 hours and have pizza stuck to their shoes. Uh, <laughs> so um, 
it's just so cool that you're getting that that sort of engagement and 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 passion that they want to get back you know they're like okay we thought it through let's get back to the computer here um so it seems like this cohort is all about the video games what what's <laughs> what sort of um if if you could kind of lead the direction more and and choose something for them to focus on like let's say in one of these space camp weeks what what would kind of like your ideal session be that you'd really like to get down to the nitty gritty with them yeah and i think and we're early on so we've had two um and so definitely i'm gonna like introduce more things like web design and things like that and we could always bring it back to the video games um but i think now that they have like had the opportunity to explore that like it's like yeah it scratched that itch for them <laughs> in a way that i think they'll be more open um I, so much of this is just like long-term relationship building with them too um that yeah um so i think ideally if we had like say like a week to just like fully immerse um then trying to i because of the um um ugh, no words um the public uh volunteering aspect of my like life um i would love to um i love involving kids at an early age and like volunteering and things like that um and i think that um adults let alone kids don't realize how much power they can have in their local town and things like that um so giving them the opportunity to say like what's a thing that like kind of exploring gaps um in the community and if there's something that they could do to like fill that gap so for instance like um say like a community calendar something that's like always yeah. come up in town i don't know that i would say, like that sounds pretty dry for the kids to like go to calendar but that idea that like they could create solutions to problems that we have here or if um they have something that they wish was better promoted in town or things like that like trying to figure out ways that they could um help with actually solving problems um that they can see every day um i think it's important that that's a pretty awesome pretty awesome goal to have there um <laughs> now one of one of the other things that you know like we're, we're running into nevada county um can, we've got a great guy who's helped I believe he helped with the club when it was up and running before as far as tech and back end. Um, what, and it sounded like, so the, the IT teacher in high school that helped you, what was that a man or a woman? Yeah, man. Yep. So what, what do you feel is, is a good way? What, what, what's the place for the, at this point, 76% of the tech field that are men, how can we support and, get those numbers to be, have more parity. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I feel like, so I had, I feel like what was good examples of, of <laughs> like a male uh, peers um, in, so in computer science, when I was at UVM, I was the only um, girl uh, most of the time. Um, but I had like, and I struggled through like the bat I'm definitely more of a front end person. Um, I like coding and then seeing it actually like do the thing um, versus the like the back end um, slog <laughs> sometimes feels like for me. Um, so I, I mean, they were really supportive and helping. Um, I had a male, um, I had men like male teachers for all of that. Um, but in each of those cases, um, the teachers, like I did um, some, uh, kind of like almost intern work for a nonprofit during my time at UVM where I, mm -hmm. I don't even remember what I, I think I was doing a database for some kind of like mathematic community mathematics nonprofit or something. Um, and so, but my teacher like encouraged, like that was a passion for me to like do, um, do the giving back part. Um, and so, and the same, like when I, tra when I transferred to Linden, um, I was like, I already did this. <laughs> like, I want to do this. Um, and just being more flexible as far as like letting, um, like there's a certain thing to be said for like doing, you know, the curriculum as it is, but also allowing some flexibility for like passions that like, if the men are the ones creating all of the curriculum, it may not be <laughs> something that'll keep like a few, you know, I'm generalizing, but in general, you know what I'm saying is like, um, 
allowing flexibility for people, no matter their gender or background, that they're able to like make it their own. Um, I think it's really important. That's a really uh, ex excellent insight as as we look to, you know, get our program up to where you've got yours going, which is uh, up and running. <laughs> um, ah, we're getting close to the end of the time today here. So I want to make sure we uh, wrap up any, any thoughts here. Um, central element that, that I've got from you is it's just you gotta you gotta listen to the students right it's, it's you gotta be like okay what do the people that are excited about this that are doing it want to actually do and it sounds like girls who code has both a flexible curriculum but you've you've also been supplementing it um were those supplements were you able to find those resources through girls who code through your own networks how did you make those decisions of what to bring in uh yeah to... actually I uh, it's kind of a mix. It's kind of serendipitous in a way. So like the Sphero, I, so um, when I started in my co-working space, I had gone in the research phase of kind of developing a business was um, as a nonprofit was to go to all the different spaces, similar in Vermont, New Hampshire, but I even went to like Manhattan and Seattle and Oregon and, and things like that. Um, and so I didn't keep it specific to co-working i also did maker spaces and things so i recently went back and like toured some of the ones that I had toured like four years ago to see how they had evolved over time because we're constantly changing um and uh one of the maker spaces in rutland um the mint uses the spiros and she was like super easy all ages you need to get these things <laughs> um so i did and then i tried them out um with actually i had one of the students who I knew was wanted to be in the class um, but couldn't make the time work and I said do you want to just help me figure out my way through this curriculum that I've never used before and see if you like it so I can see if other girls will like it uh, <laughs> so we did that and that was a hit so um, and then Bloxels was actually um, girls who code once you have a chapter they'll give you um, things like swag um, and the benefits of having like a bigger overarching organization um, along with like brand recognition is uh, they also have grant money to give, I think it's like up to $500 per chapter to like buy supplemental things. So it could be Sphero. Um, so I looked at, they have like, samples of like what other, I had no idea what, uh, what to ask for. Um, and so they have a thing with like, look at other um, examples of what other groups have had on their, on their wish list or Amazon mm -hmm. wish list. Um, and so I started just clicking around on all of the random stuff that other clubs were using. Um, and that actually, it was an Amazon recommendation. Not that I want to pitch Amazon, <laughs> the Amazon recommendation <laughs> um, for this Bloxels thing. And I was like, well, what is that? Um, so then I clicked through um, and I actually bought licenses for it and it was uh, EDU only. And so I was trying to find um, a school to like kind of sponsor this. Um, but I reached out to Bloxels and I said, I'm not an EDU. I really want to use this for kids. Um, and they were flexible and they, they, they hooked it up. So, um, yeah. Very cool. So, you know, talk to other people that do what you do, which is what I'm doing right now. Hopefully we can use some of these ideas and uh, put, put them to work in Nevada County. Um, yeah, actually, David, I want to throw out there that like, I would love to partner with like Nevada chapter. Um, I'm all about uh, just, you know, we could remotely partner on anything so talk yep. about like robotics clubs or cross girls who code clubs or anything i would like i'm, I'm down nevada <laughs> we, we will we'll totally uh connect up with you that was actually ken's uh was like oh i'd like to talk to monique and i'm like okay <laughs> totally we'll we'll, uh, we'll make it happen um cool uh, i want to wrap this up because we're, we're hitting our time as far as this podcast so I've been talking with Monique Priestley, uh, the founder and executive director at the Space on Main in Bradford, Vermont, all about girls who code. Uh, hopefully we'll have our local Nevada County chapter up and running again in the spring and can join in with the almost more than half a million girls, women, and non-binary individuals coding through the Girls Who Code in-person programming, which is so cool. So thanks so much for joining me, Monique. Uh, we look forward to collaborating on Girls Who Code in the future. Cool. Thanks so much, David.